<laughs> Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We have a very exciting episode coming at you. We're gonna be talking about force bathing. We have the founder of Force Bathing Club joining us on the show, Julia, Julia Plevin. Hey. Thanks for coming on to the show. Oh, my pleasure. Really appreciate it. <laughs> I've been having a, a lot of great conversations with you and a lot of other people about stewardship for Earth and caring about what goes on with our connection to Earth and our connection to nature. I think force bathing's like totally, and nature bathing in general is like at the forefront of connecting people to Earth. Yeah. And you're, you're there two and a half years into it. And I want to talk about that. We'll get there. But let's talk about you first. Okay. You know, who are you? How did you end up becoming who you are today? Yeah, that is a big question. Yeah. Um, I would say that I'm someone who's always loved nature. I grew up in the suburbs of DC, so it wasn't like living, you know, in nature that connected really. Went to college in New England to be in nature, um, surfed, rock climbed trail run, always on the go though. And it wasn't until I moved to New York City to grad school in design that I started to understand the mental health effects of being connected to nature and then disconnected, disconnected from nature. And um, really like why I love nature is that it makes me feel good. And when I'm disconnected from nature, I start to get super anxious and stressed and a lot of health issues, like my own health issues, and I realized that basically every health issue stems on some level from a disconnection from nature, including like addiction and overconsumption. Um, and that to me kind of pieced it all together. Um, like in design, we have human-centered design, which has kind of like been the, the past 10, 15 years, it's been like the, how to design things for human needs. And I'm like, and then there's been design for sustainability, but it's been disconnected. I'm like, actually, if we're designing for humans and we're not designing also this like whole systems level for the planet, then we're not designing for humans because we are nature and we need to be connected to nature, you know? And if it's not serving nature, it's ultimately not serving us either. <laughs> yes, yes. So this is, you start, you started, when you started talking about this, you, you were teaching me about how you, you're very confident that a lot of our uh, our addictions, our overconsumptions, a lot of the so-called pathologies that we have within society stem from our disconnect from yeah. nature. So tell us about that. Yeah, so I, in grad school, went super deep and stumbled into all of these terms that were created to talk about the ways that being disconnected from nature makes us sick, um, especially on a mental, like, level, which to me, as someone who has had anxiety for most of my life, I was like, found myself in all of these terms. Um, one that we talked about was eco-anxiety, which is just like anxiety over the state of what's happening on the planet. Um, and then the extreme of that is eco-paralysis, which is like, oh my God, these problems are so big and I am so small that I can't do anything. Let's break these down one at a time. I have them okay. up here. So eco-anxiety. Yeah. Okay, anxiety over what's happening on the planet. Okay, so this is, is this stem from a, like we, like you, you feel maybe a little bit of the, the, the deforestations and the ocean acidifications, that type of stuff? Right, so, you know, we talk, so anxiety and stress are like such huge issues right now, right? On our, and like, but people don't really realize that it comes like that anxiety we feel is because the earth is, it's like we feel what the earth feels because we are the earth. So like, you know, we're feeling. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we are one with the planet. So we, we feel the acidification of the oceans. We feel the fish dying, the coral reefs dying. Right, and so De like. The decrease in oxygen from the deforestation. Yeah. Exactly. and. Um, there's a whole like eco psychology, eco therapy, this idea that, you know, um, you go to a therapist and you sit on a couch and you like talk about your relations with your parents and your friends, and you don't ever talk about your relationship with the earth. That's right. <laughs> That's a really good point. 
So that's really interesting. So psychologists, psychiatrists, we rarely, we rarely talk, even with our friends when we're hanging out. When do we ever talk about, you know, how's your relationship with Earth? How do you feel about nature right now? Yeah. When do we ask that? Right. And how is that affecting our psyche? Yeah. So keep, keep teaching us. Yeah. So that's, that's e really interesting. So that's ego anxiety. It's like a paradigm shift to have more conversations about our relationship with nature. I love that. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good, because we love asking questions on the show, obviously. Sweet. So, yeah. so if we can ask more questions in our day-to-day -day interactions with other people and ask them about how they feel currently about the state of nature, that's a really great idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And like just knowing what is present in nature right now, you know, so like not disconnecting your personal experience and what the earth is experiencing, but realizing that it's connected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you recommend prior to moving on? Yeah. How do you recommend people get past the, the, that there is a wall between me and the other, like that, that I am part of the interconnectedness. How do you recommend people to get so that's where forest bathing comes in. Okay, okay, so we'll have to get there <laughs> towards, okay, perfect. Yeah, so we're getting there. Okay. Um, there's a whole host of these terms, and I, like, love learning about them. We can, we can go through a couple Let's, of these. Please, okay. yes, I really want to keep going through these. Okay, yes. eco -paralysis. so eco-paralysis is, like, I'm so overwhelmed about all of the stuff going on that I just don't know what to do, so I'm going to do nothing. And, um, Damn. Yeah. That's almost as though when your to-do list is so overwhelming that you're like, eh, I'm just gonna, you know, watch a movie and go to bed instead. That's kind of what that feels like. Yeah. When you look at Earth and you see that. It's okay, continue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, solastalgia. We're ready to move on? Yeah. I'm just, you want more on eco-paralysis? You're so, it's so, it's fascinating that you bring these terms into our nomenclature because these are... These seem like they're neologisms. Well, solastalgia is for sure neologism, yeah. but the <clears throat> these are so important that you brought yeah. them into into light. For yeah, us. yeah, and um, so there's there's all of these terms which are so important because they bring awareness to all of these feelings that we're feeling that we don't actually know. It's like if you learned the word like joy, and you're like, oh my god, that's an emotion I feel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or like you learn sadness, like you learn the more that we can like bring shine light on different emotions. We're like, it's like, oh, it, it makes our experience make more sense. Yes. Yes. So now we have a word to go along with the feeling, which is a feeling of in sometimes this overwhelming feeling or this anxious feeling about what's going on on the planet. Okay. Um, and then I'll also ask you about what is kind of the first things we can do. So as we go to the nature bathing club, then there's also other things that we can do to act, to be activist in this. Yeah. Field. Okay. So I would say the first step is awareness, like know that there's a problem, right? And it's like, if you don't know there's anything wrong, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. So these terms are really helpful in that, like bringing light, the problems to light. Yes. Um, yes. So, so let's, let's do it. Let's go on. Yeah. Solastalgia is um, a loss of solace for a place you never left as it has changed. And like we were talking about this, we see this in San Francisco, people lamenting over the artists being kicked out or all the techies coming in or all these big buildings and the city's changing. Um, but now we see it really clearly on an environmental scale in California, the forests, you know, being fire, like turned to ashes right now. and Towns decimated. Um, you can see the satellite imagery of places like the Amazon rainforest just literally it looks like a, a worm weasel through, like a road. Yeah. And then it's just branches off that road of just for, the forest has just been literally football field by football field taken and driven back to off that road. Yeah. Yeah. It's insanity. It's insanity. Yeah. Okay. So, so, then, so then continue, continue on this because this is... This is a neologism. This is definitely yeah. new. So it's like... It's a researcher, Glenn Albrecht, in Australia coined this term. Okay. Yeah. 
But what's yeah, his, it's, it's what's a, his name? Glenn Albrecht. Yeah, G L E N. He owes me money. Glenn Albrecht. Yeah, two N's I think on Glenn, but that should come out. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there he is. Professor of Sustainability at Murdoch University in Western Australia. Retired in 2014. Honorary Fellow at the School of Geosciences. Interesting. I would love to meet this guy. Environmental philosopher, theoretical and applied interest in relationship between ecosystem and human health. He was pioneered the research domain psychoterratic. Interesting. Or earth-related mental health conditions. Fascinating. Yeah. Wow. The concept of solar nostalgia or the lived experience of negative environmental change. Wow. Field of animal ethics and ethics of relocating endangered species in the face of climate change pressures. Whoa. What an interesting word, though. Solastalgia yeah. and then also psychoterratic. Yeah, psychoterratic. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, Terra, Earth, and psycho. Yeah. Mental health. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> the way you're like your way your eyes like light up about this like it, you know it expresses your like deep yeah. passion and care about this it's it's been you know and it's one of those things where you're like i've been researching this for so long and like and then it's like finally i'm like there's someone who thinks this is like worthy i'm like thank you <laughs> because i've been living in my own little um world you know these terms i always thought were so fascinating and people were like enough with your like weird words already um and now we're finally at the point where it's like haters gonna hate <laughs> haters gonna hate <laughs> enough with your weird words like, no these are very important super words. important yeah. yeah yeah um yeah yeah like we were, we were talking earlier about uh coherence and resonance and stuff like that they can sound like they're like weird words, but they're actually extremely important words that will likely take on a major role in society once uh, it awakens more yeah. and adapts. Yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, so you studied people like Glenn for like two for a couple of years. Yeah. 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 And um, so I was in design school though, which is people are like, why are you studying this in design school? Um, I was on my own kind of like deep nature connection exploration like in my own little world in New York City um, okay. and I thought I was all alone in it until I like got deeper and realized that there's a lot of people doing this work yeah. but um, in Japan when were those first forced bathing uh, measurements of cortisol levels in Japan yeah so um, Shinrin Yoku which means forest bathing literally bathing in the forest atmosphere yeah, yeah um, that was that word came about in nineteen early nineteen eighties. And Shinrin Yoku, there it is. Yeah, interesting. And that um, taking in the forest atmosphere, Shinrin Yoku. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And they did all of this research, and it was based on the phytoncides, which is the oils that the trees emit. What are they called? Phytoncides. Fighting size? Fighting size. How do I spell that? P H Y T O N C I D E S. Interesting. Yeah. Substance emitted by plants and trees in general means the aroma of the forest. Phyton means plant in Latin, and side means to exterminate. So, what's crazy is this: these oils, Whoa. breathing in these oils has yeah. all of these, um, it lowers your. It increases your natural killer cells, so it lowers like your like uh, decreases bleh, cancer. Like it's preventative of cancer. It has all these benefits. Yeah, but um, yeah. what's interesting, and this is like the beautiful how systems in nature work, is that trees emit phytoncides as like to wear it off um, insects. Yeah, so it's a protection. To help plants and trees protect themselves from harmful insects and germs. So it's protecting the trees, oh, but it's that. really good for us, and it protects us. Like it's this. So crazy then, when we take in phytoncides, we also protect ourselves from, like you said, these cancer or these. We decrease our stress hormones. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Phytoncides. Yeah, because we are evolved to be in relation with nature and trees, so everything is like. Yeah. Perfect. Right. Yes, yes. 
wow, there's such a distinct difference between, between, you know, like, there's like a hugely like distinct difference between like these two, like these, like images like this <clears throat> compared to, this is Muir Woods, yeah. right? Just in our North, in our North Bay. Yeah. And then this is, Right? So this is insane. The comparison between these two things, like I know. So Shinrin Yoku they now have like in Japan these forest bathing stations throughout the country. And they have it's part of their preventive health care. And um since then, since this research on the fight insides, there's been all this other research on the benefits of nature including looking at images of nature is actually, oh, yeah. you know, like people who have windows and hospitals that look out to nature heal faster. Right. Just having photos of nature event studies will decrease your stress. Um, why are we locked into the white rooms? Like, wh why don't we have the, like with the window in the yeah. hospital, why don't we have the, the, a bunch of plants in the, in the, <laughs> as close as we can do in the office buildings that we have. And I think that will come like as awareness around just how much nature makes us feel better and makes us healthier. Like I can imagine bringing nature back into the cities and like there is a movement of like going out to nature and there is a, I don't actually believe go in going out to nature because nature is all around, all us. around us. We are nature, we but are nature, you know, yeah. there's being like in remote places, but then there's also being in cities of when, and I think like bringing, integrating that nature back into the yes. city is a huge, it's where we're going to have to move. You know, it's this huge opportunity. You're, uh, you're familiar with arcology? Not arcology, the word, but that's a cool word. Arcology combines ecology with architecture. Wow. Yeah. So the general idea is can, what is the future of architecture, of incorporating yeah. nature into what we build? Yeah. As housing, as offices, as structures, as all this different type of yeah. stuff. And so um, this is a huge thing that I'm very passionate about, very excited about. And it kind of, kind of, you, you put it into two interesting perspectives. There's, there's going out to, which I want to, I want to ask you about this, but you know, there's going out to nature and then there is bringing nature to the buildings that we live in. There's mm -hmm. kind of this two set, there's two distinctly like different movements. Mm -hmm. um, you were t teaching us that there are, right now there are locations in Japan where they do actually like specifically meant to take people out to go and yeah. force bathe. Yeah, all, there's like little bases all around the country. Um, and I've had the opportunity to go to a couple which are Sweet. really awesome and go on a forest bathing with a guide in Japan um, and see how they do it which is you know, it's a practice that the term comes from Japan, but the practice of connecting to nature is part of all original culture. You know, like any traditional culture has their practice of going connecting to nature for spiritual reason. You know, um, and it's just something that's like been lost over over time. And so it doesn't. There's elements of it that, like the practice itself, doesn't come from Japan. You know, they put a name to it, but it's if anything, it ties back into Japan their like Shinto Buddhist tradition then Japan is just so inherently like aware of nature they don't actually even have awareness of how interconnected they are to nature mm -hmm. I w do you think that this is the right move to have the these locations in the countries in like in, in Germany and in South Africa and in Nigeria and Brazil yeah. etc do you think that having the sites near metropolises where people can go once a week or to go to? Yeah, this is a good question. So I think first, um, to me, forest bathing is a way in. It's a process, you know, like how do you, how do we bring this into greater awareness? And I, I want to step back because first we have all of these terms that we were talking about. Okay, let's go back to the Yeah, terms. the terms, are, it's a okay. really important storyline because yes. what happens is People don't need, okay, so another one is generational environmental amnesia, which is that people think the nature that they grow up with 
is normal, but really it's being degraded over time. And so I was saying, like, me growing up in the suburbs, I thought was normal, but 30 years ago that had been wild. And the other day I saw a kid walking around San Francisco with a mask on because we're currently dealing with all our fires. Um, and it's become normalized. It's so. become normalized, so he'll grow up thinking that this is just like November, it's wildfire season. And um, actually I've heard that it might not just be November, you know, it's mean yeah, <laughs> more yeah. and more. But um, what happens is we have all these ways that nature makes that, this disconnection makes us anxious and stressed and sick, but how do you heal that? And um, it was actually Glenn, Glenn Albrecht who coined solastalgia, who also coined the term solophilia. Oh, interesting, solophilia. Which means cool. connecting, going to nature as a way to heal yourself, your community, and the planet. Mm -hmm. And um, when I heard that, I was like, awesome. And I really tried to make the word solophilia happen. I was like, I'm leading solophilia groups. <laughs> and you know, I'm like, I don't know. It's like <laughs> it's in tune neologism. It's yeah. too new. Yeah. Yeah. Of the word. yeah. Yeah. And it was just like sounds like a disease or something. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. Uh, but then I came across the term forest bathing and I was like, that sounds cool. Yes. So that's why I started it. I called it the forest bathing club. Yep. And um, but really it is a practice of coming together <sighs> and going to nature um, as a, and it's about like getting out of your head, dropping into your heart, awakening your senses, um, different practices that you can go and do or different invitations of ways to connect and then coming back and integrating in circle. And it's really important that you have that like go out and can come back because it starts to build this container and you like you see something that I don't see and it just like we all um, create this deep experience together yeah and it's amazing because you start you go out as a way of healing and you know because of the science but then once you're there you realize there's so much more that's going on and to me there's like an inherently spiritual element to it of you get whatever message you're meant to at that time from nature and um yeah I have one invitation where I like I have a story that I can talk to trees and I mm -hmm. go to a tree and I'll ask it a question of like something I'm dealing with in my life. Some, like I have this problem or I have this decision, what should I do? And I get some kind of knowing from a higher place yeah. back. And when I first started telling that to people, I was like, they're gonna think I'm crazy. But then I did it again and again and everyone got a message back. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, and so like it quickly becomes like you go out because of the health benefits, but you quickly get these like this heightened, you know, spiritual or like this higher place that then helps you navigate your life. Um, yes, yes. The the way that you're describing it is so. It's it's relatable because I think and I feel that when the first instances of us leaving the metropolis area and going to Muir Woods or Stinson Beach or wherever we're going, that we, we finally get to feel the, the feelings of earth that are not when we are behind a computer and we're kind of locked into buildings mm -hmm. versus being out on a beach or out amongst trees because then when you when you see the birds that are flying and when you see the squirrels that are running across the tree branches and when you smell the is the, the fight 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 on fight inside <laughs> uh-huh oh my gosh what a cool word um when that when that happens it that's 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 an awareness shift totally and that's the connection to nature connection exactly. to earth and a lot of things happen, like you start to realize that you're really small, yeah. you know? <laughs> ego gets dwarfed. Yeah. And you start, like there's all these studies, one of my favorite ones is that people looking up at a tree for one minute experience a greater sense of awe. So just good one. one minute of looking at a tree and you like, and awe is so important. related to all these other positive, exactly. you know, things of like collaboration and... Um, 
I went to Humboldt last year. They had the big sequoias up there. Yeah. And uh, it was fascinating. It's, yeah. I, I felt it. It was beautiful. I just felt small because they're huge trees. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I get your drift. I just, sorry, go back. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. Ron, Ron, when you when you speak like that on the show, it makes me wanna you know give you that that big hug. Yeah. Yeah. Don't touch me. Yeah. <laughs> Ron. <laughs> Ron's usually the. the no, the but uh, last year around this time, I was uh, like I, I mentioned, though I, I've never uh, seen trees that large ever in my life, so uh, I was uh, overwhelmed. So what else is Look beautiful? Look how warm he is, even just talking about it. So what's amazing so, uh, about nature is that people are going to be like, meditation, not for me, ayahuasca, not for me, all these uh, things, but no yeah. one says nature, not for me. That's right. Because it's like, That's right. it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's biophilia. We are like, yeah. we are inherently attracted to nature. Like. That's a really good one. We're part of it. Yeah. Biophilia. And the, it's, you bring up this great point, which is we get all these not for me's, the Meditation, not for me. Psychedelics, not for me. Nature, uh, well, okay, fine. Like, okay, I like, sure, I'll go out to the beach. Sure, I'll, yes. go, I'll go out to the forest. I can yeah. do that. And people have their own practices of doing it, you know, but there's always people, it's, I've never met a human who like, I mean, maybe there actually, there is instances of people who grew up in cities or who have been conditioned that nature is dangerous. That's right, yeah. Um, it's so sad. They grew up in the metropolis and they never actually saw the Milky Way. They, get, they never saw the galaxy yeah. because they never went out to pitch darkness away from the light pollution to be able to look up. They've seen like five stars. Yeah. And then, you know, what happens then is you don't, if you don't have that appreciation like growing up, then it's really hard to come into as an adult. Yes. Um, yes. So. I, and... <clears throat> You know, I have, I had this, I have a, I had this hypothesis written here, just right under, you know, it's, it's, this is, you know, this is, it's right here. Just one third of all engineers in the Bay Area haven't been to the Pacific Ocean. And I, you can just broaden that and say techies. I don't know if that's true or not. That's, that's a hypothesis. Yeah. But I think if we took a poll of all of the techies that have moved to the Bay Area, I'd be curious to see how many of them haven't been to the Pacific Ocean yet. Totally. And this is part of um, what I was saying is like with all of the knowledge I have around the benefits of being in nature and like why don't I live in the middle of a forest? Why am I in San Francisco? Right. And I sort of, I feel that it's part of my dharma to bring nature and the benefits of it to Silicon Valley to the techies, the people who are creating our future. Yes. Because if we are able to get them tapped in and connected, then, you know, technology is a reflection of our consciousness. That's right. So if we get them connected to nature consciousness, then they'll create things that, you know, are aligned with the planet. And that's what we really need right now. I love you, Julia. <laughs> I love you so much. Your your mission is extremely important. You're, you're And you know you're speaking about it on a civilizational level. You're not like, hey, I'm going to go take, you know, one person out. You're like, no, I'm going to take Silicon Valley out. Yes. I'm going to take Shenzhen and Beijing. I'm going to take the world out to the, the, these hubs that are building the future. They need to go out and into nature because it's going to be a reflection of what they make as technology. That's, that's really important. And that's how we can solve some of the ethical and moral quandaries that we face. Totally. Yeah. There's like, you know, what would nature do? Like, that's kind of how I, I always think about things now. <laughs> it's like, what is, what is the living system? Like, what is the example from nature? And this is a system that has been working for billions of years. And we have been this like blip on the planet. We have everything to learn from the way that nature does things. And that's where like biomimicry comes in. That's where... Um, like regenerative comes in. That's where, yeah, this uh, Institute for Earth-Based Inquiry that I've been building as part of like a, you know, a forest bathing is this recreational two and a half hour experience. I believe it's transformational, but then it's like, what next? Yes. Which we wanted to talk about this too, is like, how do you get to the, the action item from the, you feel, okay, you feel anxiety, you go forest bathe then what do I do after that to help be a part of the solution? Totally. Yeah. And then, you know, first you bring 
you start to bring that and integrate it back into your life. So whatever lessons you get from nature you bring in, you can also physically bring it in. Like we're talking about having plants, having little stones, things that remind you of like a, call it like an instant forest bath. You know, you're like, Z okay, like, you know, there's bigger systems out there connected to something larger. Um, and then there's like principles that you start to learn from how nature works. And that is where there's so much exciting things to learn of, like how fractals and the cycles of nature, you know, and even using that like in our workflow, how can we tap into seasonality in work? Like we, you know, a tree isn't bearing fruit all year round. It's only in the fall after going through a whole process. There's a lot of like time where in the winter where you're more dormant and looks like there's not much going on, but there's a lot happening beneath the surface. Um, like okay. starting to learn from all of these systems. Yeah. Yes. We were, we, we had started talking about the way that we were, for some reason we were interestingly talking about procrastination as well earlier. Yeah. And we were wondering, do do like trees procrastinate? Right. Well, I'm pretty sure, and we'd have to research this more, but I'm pretty sure when a tree has a surplus of CO2 that it gives the CO2 to the trees that don't, that aren't unable to get it from the tops of the, of the, of the atmosphere yeah. that, that, that they're not actually touching, that they're not hitting. Yeah. And so, and I believe that it's a root system. It's a root system connection from tree to tree. And that I don't think it like hoard, it doesn't, definitely doesn't hoard it. We've seen that because we've made a radioactive isotope of carbon and then followed it. Mm. And then that's how we learned that about cool. the tree systems yeah. talking underneath the roots. But, you know, we were also talking about squirrels. And yeah. if squirrels go and bury so many of their nuts and acorns and then they only recover, we learned 74% right. of them. Right, and we were saying how like silly squirrels, they don't have very, they're not very smart, they lose all of their acorns. And we're like, well, wait a second, why? And then we realized that that's actually, they're planting trees. Exactly. And it's like this perfectly designed system, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it's just, it's amazing. Um, and then also trees need a trigger. So like um, an environmental, trigger like a fire will cause a tree to release or plant to release seeds so when mm. there's stress you know or like when a tree's had a really hard winter it'll like have extra fruit so it like it's like these or like a when it's dying it'll release everything it has and it's like this impulse just to like give and to continue life and mm -hmm. that like mm -hmm. that is the impulse we all have is like to keep life going yeah. What, so where where are you now with Forest Bathing Club? How far along? How many of these two and a half hours have you done now? I've done a lot. Um, I probably close to a hundred that I've led. Sweet. Yeah. And whereabouts? So a lot in the city, um, and that was part of like in the Presidio in Presidio. Cool. Sutro yeah. Forest, Lands End, and that was part of it. Like, yes, we can go to Muir Woods. Yes. You know, we have amazing nature right here, but we don't have to leave. To we don't. No. Golden Gate Park and, yeah, like you said, Fort Funston, Presidio or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And I was for a while leading Airbnb experiences. And, you know, through that, like, mm -hmm. v like a group of VCs would come on a forest <laughs> bath. And ha. Um, you'd be like, hey, guys, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah, it's like they loved it. Um, and then I took a lot of this year on my own like deep connection writing a book on this mm -hmm. upcoming book very excited yeah the healing magic of forest bathing yeah 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 Ooh, that's gonna be super fun because you you're 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 writing about a lot of things that we're talking about yeah on the show. yeah yeah nice um but so i was living super connected to nature and not really doing many of these forest baths and then now I'm like integrating it all back in but also wondering it's like does it need to be you know this is when you're building community you're building a culture so like does it need to be like how often do you do this how, like how do you do it what are the rituals and then again you look to nature you look to 
ancient traditions that have this, you know, and it's like, um, you know, like the moon cycle. Do you do it every new moon or full moon? Or, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. different heights of the year. That's good. Summer yeah. solstice, winter, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's important. It's important. Yeah. And Those times. Mm -hmm. Summer and solstice, you mentioned the, 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 the phases of the moon. Even every yeah, new moon and full moon, um, even every time that happens, that's, that, that'd be great. That's twice every 28 days. Yeah. That's great. And it starts to tap you into these natural rhythms. Yeah. Oof. That's great. And that's yeah. only once every two weeks. That's really not that often. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how many people were going on these? Like 10, 20? Up to 20. Yeah. Tried to limit it to 20 because otherwise then you feel like you're in a crowd but totally there's something really powerful about doing it in these groups yeah yeah when's the next one? Oh, the next one i'm actually going to do an impromptu one on this sunday after thanksgiving and i've been thinking about what to do with all these fires so i think it's it's going to be do like free forest bath but with a suggested donation Suggest to a donation, yeah. fire relief yeah that we'll figure out which one. Our, uh, and it would be potentially good to go near the ocean because it's the air is, has been it's being cleaned out by the yeah. ocean. Yeah. More cycles. Yeah, and even you know to be present with what's going on, right? So it's like yep. I was supposed to have a awesome uh, event this last weekend in Ojai at Ecotopia, and we had rented out all of the hot springs. We're That's gonna have right. yoga and CBD and forest bathing and. Um, all these people signed up, but then the fires came and I was like, well, can we still get there? Should we cancel it? And I was like, yes, not only because I don't want to be sending people that way and people are fleeing their homes and being evacuated doesn't seem right, yeah. but also because it's not the time. And a lot of this is just being present with what's actually happening. happening. And, exactly. you know, so like there is On a time yeah. to heal with nature, but there's also a time to grieve and to, yeah. you know, <laughs> and so... Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> driving towards the direction that everybody's driving away just to, to go and bathe there while right. yeah, there's this craziness happening. Yeah, so, I love I love the idea of connecting you to Murray Hittery, who does mind travel. We had him on the show as well. We've cool. done this experience. He does a lot of silent hikes, so cool. he'll throw people, he'll play piano while people are wearing and they're walking oh, and sweet. hiking. And so that'd be an interesting synergy. He also does uh, in, in pools. People wear wetsuits and you lay down in a in a pool and then the, there's underwater speakers that play that wow. plays piano, so it's vibration, it feels yeah. amazing. Um, so I think you two would be very, cool. a good uh, partner connection. Yeah. I talk yeah. about experience design or like as a designer, I love to design experience for people, but I'm like really nature is the ultimate designer. Yeah, yeah. And we are just like co-creating with nature or being mm -hmm. a vessel, you know, or <laughs> and that's what I say when you go out into the forest, like nature is the healer, nature is the teacher just opening the gate, you know, just holding the space for everyone to have their own connection to nature. And um, yeah. I think also on a healing level, like I believe that the best healers enable people to heal themselves. Yes. And nature is the ultimate healer. So like by connecting people to nature, to have their own connection they foster, they're able to then take their own healing into their own hands. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the best yeah, teachers are yeah, the ones that enable you to yourself be able to achieve what you set out to do. Exactly. Totally. totally. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Ron. That little timer. Now, yeah, Ron, you have a thought? <laughs> <laughs> no. I just, when we don't tell the guests about that, I, I, don't, I think. Sometimes we don't yeah, know. Yeah. Sometimes guests aren't prepared to die. Timer. Yeah, yeah. It's just 15 minute timer. You okay, Julia? I'm good. Uh, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So, <laughs> so this is somatic programs for accelerating connection to Earth. Is this something that you want to talk about, the space? Because I thought this was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it started by wanting to bring forest bathing more into startup world, into Silicon Valley, into corporations. Um, and what is the best way to do that? Yep. You're like, and I actually got some feedback. Again, I like, forest bathing is a great term for individuals for consume, you know, but does it work for 
how do you get people like in the office to be like, we need this? It's a jump to be like, we need forest bathing. Yeah. But yes, we need space, somatic programs for accelerating connection to earth. You know, it just, yeah. um, it's just changing the term and changing the offering slightly to be more um, aligned with what people in, who are building tech might be looking for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does this have to do with our bottom line? <laughs> right? You know, it's like the same thing, but just packaged in a way that might be, that is meant to be more, um, mm -hmm. like, yeah. This would be a fascinating measurement to do with, <clears throat> with levels of anxiety, stress, depression, also levels of, um, of like empathy or altruism. Mm -hmm. um, so pre and post, totally pre and post nature bathing, forest bathing. Yeah. And so then also then somehow measure a productivity as well. Yeah. Um, they have done all these studies and nature does is proven to increase all of these things. Yes, correct. That's the, those are the studies with Japan. Um, those have been going on for a while, yeah. but then I want to know even more so with productivity. Has that been a has that been studied? Um, I guess. I don't know about productivity, is it, but you I know said how you, awe was studied because you know they look up. And, yeah. You know, even a minute gets the awe, and awe leads to things like empathy and altruism as yeah. well. But I'd be very interested in productivity because then you could really get it to the execs and say that you know this is actually increasing productivity. Yeah, and to me, I'm like, well, what does productivity actually mean? Mean in the first <laughs> place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like productive doing what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if it's like not reaching these planetary goals, goals. and like is it even productive? Produ <laughs> yeah, is it even productive? Exactly. Yeah. We're productively building advertising. Yeah. Right. That yeah. distracts you from your goals. Like, no, that's not productive. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do believe, as I say, like it magically will reprioritize you. So you'll start to know what your priorities mm. are. And that a lot of is like the blockage to productivity is like not knowing what your priorities are. And once you're in nature, you just get a lot more clear. All that mess in your head is gone and you're able to totally focus on what you're meant to be focusing on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, part, part of that to me has so much to do, so much similarity with meditation and psychedelics as well. Exactly. Yeah. It, the, the jumble that's in our minds from waking up every day and going sleep. Mm -hmm. da, 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 wake up, da, 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 sleep, da, da. and so when you take a big long break from it, you're able to connect more to what is essentially important to you. What are your what is your essence, and um, are you act, are those meetings about meetings actually important? Right. No, <laughs> they're not. No. Um, it was so crazy after living in Simpson Beach and like I really didn't see many people like I was really, like in this like writer's little cabin and I was yeah. disconnected from a lot of society a lot of like I saw my parents and like two friends and then I came into the city and I had a meeting downtown and I was just like watching with I was, like wow yeah. what are all these people like it was just amazing they would like go and they had their lunch and they would like get into the elevator and they press a button and they get to the floor and it was like these little robots. And I was like, where, how, how does everyone know where to go? Like, they're all just like kind of programmed. <laughs> Damn, following the algorithms. Ugh. It's, can, it's, can, it can be nuts. Yeah, show up at, show up at eight, take lunch at 12, walk to a corner to get food, right. come back with food to desk, right. work until five, go home. Yeah. Like these algorithms are insanity in many yeah. ways. They're yeah. insanity. It totally is. It totally yeah. is. And it's like, then a lot of this, to me, like reconnecting to nature is also reconnecting to your, so it's outer nature and then it's your inner nature. And like, who are you? Like, who are you? What is y your actual nature? And that is to me like a lifelong discovery process. It is, yeah. And, um, yeah. but you start to realize you're like, do I actually want to eat at like eight, noon, and six? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, do I want to follow the, the cultural programming that I may not actually, that is not actually me. Right. You, you, bring, you bring up a very interesting point. I like, I've started to call it maybe civilization design or planetary architecture, right? Yeah. And you seem to be very awakened to what is 
what was it again? It was it was uh, it was it was eco 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 anxiety. A bit of that. A bit of like a bit of soul nostalgia, etc. It's just this. You 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 can you see it architected in a way that can you see a more beautiful architecture. Yeah. And I do too in many ways. Yeah. And and okay, so now let's let's talk about the action. Okay. Okay. So how do we architect that? Yeah. Yeah. To integrate it in, and that I think a lot of it is um, there's a guy Ron Finley. Um, who talks, he does this, uh, these gardens in LA and they're like, talks about the garden that we need to be gardening is the garden between our two eyes. Ooh. <laughs> and cool. I think that is a lot of it is like up leveling our consciousness. And then it, then it's like once that's set in motion, then everything else will be set in motion. Cause I do believe that we are all on this planet at this time for a purpose that you know, it's like things come up from the earth at certain times, certain things. Like there's all of these invasive species that are actually medicine right now. Um, and they're we, medicine, they're like, they're, they're teaching us about. No, like physically. Me- so like as there's all these like um, stomach issues, you know, like IBS, platelets, there's, mm-hmm. there's herbs that are popping up that are like, that heal that, heal that. and yeah. they're invasive, but they're actually, the earth is like, hey, I'm giving you this medicine right now. And, and maybe the, the, these things like IBS and stuff are, are a learning experience for us. I, li- I like to sometimes think of some of the darkness on the planet as a learning experience. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what happens is like, it's meant for us to remember. Meant for us to remember. That's a good way to put it. Okay, so, so, be, so if, if we focus between our two eyes, if we focus on the, the pineal gland, if we focus on the pituitary gland, if we focus on our mind and our soul, our body, if we focus on this and de- leveling this up over time, continuously increasing our awareness, our connection to nature, then the end results will come. Right. So, okay. So, yes. And what I believe is like when we literally physically have our feet in the earth, our hands in the dirt, um, we start to, that just starts to happen naturally. Like, yeah, we can go out on all these crazy trips and all these whatever, but you can also just spend a lot of time in nature and that'll start to happen. Um, But what I believe is that this purpose, you know, like just as these plants have purpose are popping up, we have a purpose for being here. And it literally, it comes from the earth and it rises up through our body and our head is the last thing to know. So by being in nature, we are able to get clear on what we're meant to do. And what I'm meant to do on this planet is different from what you're meant to do. Like it's all in service of something greater than ourselves. It's all in service of the greatest good and like life continuing, but it's going to be different for each. We're talking about like each person has their own place, their their own unique purpose that none of us have. So like me telling you how to live isn't right either because it's like you're going to have your own right way to do it and it's just about connecting yourself so that you can figure that out Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and once we are all like someone is going to be an amazing scientist who's going to solve like you know climate change someone else is going to be able to solve this someone else you know like yeah I just I a lot of what you say about putting your hands and your feet into the actual sand or dirt that that reminds me of the childlike spirit that when you come back to that childhood mentality being able to to just be free and play that that can bring you into a closer tie with totally. nature. Totally. Oh my god. Why have we been like conditioned that play is not productive or like play is bad and like work is supposed to be serious. Well, because there's a dark villain that doesn't want us to remember these things and do these things. There's something among us that just wants to take complete control, wants to think it's God, wants us to mind our business, pay our taxes and just go along to get along. (laughs) That's why. What do you think about the dark villain? Um, What are your thoughts about or feelings about that? Like the, the... what is the darkness? 
Yeah. Oh man, I I really try not to spend too much time. That's in- a great answer because you're right. I can't. Ron loves feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 no, your best bet. Like I I, I it, it doesn't come very easy for me because it it knows my name, it has my number, so I can't easily dismiss it. But for anybody that's w- what you're doing, Julia, you know, s- stay the course, keep your eye on the prize, and you are you are leaving whatever dark villain that is among us in the dust. So it's in that's your best right. interest to not even acknowledge it. That's right. Yeah, I love it. Okay. I love it. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Good, good answer. So, Thanks, and, and and briefly back to children and play yeah. versus work. Uh, where you were going with yeah. that? Yeah. Because ultimately, like you know, we talk about we're here to love and play. We're here to be wild tenders of the earth and to love and play, and that's basically what it comes down to. And I want to make sure we talk about wild tenders on the way out because you taught me about wild tenders and I was like, oh my God, that's like what I've been thinking about with being a, a, the, the pinnacle of a potential civilization. What, what would it look like if we were at the pinnacle of what a civilization looks like? And I think that means like perfect harmonic stewardship with the planet. And that's what you were teaching me about wild tenders, which is Native American. Yeah, so it's this concept, you know, we have this idea of nature as being like hands off, leave no trace. It's a museum that we just are like go to enjoy. But actually, um, especially in California, the Native Americans were very hands on with nature. And you co you you how do what's the tribe name? Again? Oh, you, that was I'm not oh, sure. Oh, that oh, was. I have I've have it written down. The tribe name is the um, that was It's the U Yurok tribe. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's I mean throughout California, but uh, in the Klamath, up in Klamath, the Rock. Yep. But like, you know, here we have um, the Miwok and Miwok. Um, mm-hmm. So they are involved in nature, but involved in like you know planting wild tent, like planting seeds, pruning leaves, and it's like part of the ecosystem, but serving it in a way that's beneficial. And it's kind of like the squirrels, like part of the ecosystem, forgetting their acorns in a way that's beneficial because it then grows trees. Yeah. And that's what we are, our best use of being here is to be wild tenders. Wild tenders so not yeah. like trying to control, but just trying t- to serve in a way that's like. Exactly. Serve the stewardship. Yeah. And then serve the soul as well. Yeah. The way. Yeah. You were jumping me into a very interesting conversation before this about simulation theory, uh, because the show is called Simulation. We love asking people about if we're in a simulation. Yeah. What do you think is the answer to that? You know, I, I was just saying I read this book, How to Break Loose from the Money Game, mm-hmm. and I don't. It's a cool story that it's sim- everything's a simulation, and that we're just like. It's a movie and it's powered by, you know, pattern and power. And we can change our patterns and mm. change the simulation. Mm. Um, I just read this book. I haven't seen the results yet in terms of breaking loose from the money game. Mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. but it is a kind of funny thing. Like We're on our way. Like certain, the idea is like certain stereotypes happen where you're like, that is a perfect character, you know? Like, yeah. of course, like, that character is designed that way. It's, like, yeah. two, like, things that happen are, like, eerily, like... <laughs> Simulated. Yeah. Looks like it. Yeah, feels like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, jury's out, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that we're not. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> um, all right, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? most beautiful thing in the world is, wow, um, I think it's flow, Mm -hmm. the flow, and like, you know, we talk a lot in Silicon Valley, like flow state, but like actually being in the flow, like (coughs) in the ocean, you know, and I love to surf, and I think every metaphor of life comes from that, like, just, like, the ego death again and again as you're surfing and catching the wave and staying on the wave and, um, you know, and, like, that feeling of being in flow on the ground, too, 
and seeing flow and seeing that like that is the animator of all of life. Mm -hmm. well, that's a great answer, being in flow. That might, that might be another interesting way to say that is like meaningful engagement. Mm. I found that to be an interesting one. Jordan Peterson taught me about that one. I like that flow and meaningful engagement. It's like the, it's like the deepest of cognitive instincts. Totally. This, this like flow. Intuition. And, you know, this gets into like that feminine knowing too, of like yeah. just that intuitive sense. And mm -hmm. um, I, it isn't a mistake that all, a lot of what we learn from nature is also what we learn from feminine intelligence because that is nature. Yeah. You know, it's these, it's collaboration. It's mm -hmm. following your intuition. It's yeah. empathy. <laughs> yes. Stewardship. Mm -hmm. Seeing, you were t also teaching us about seeing earth through the lens seeing, seeing seeing reality through the lens of earth yeah and when you see reality through the lens of earth you can feel better for earth and for the systems on the planet and how to be a proper steward and care about each other as humans yeah julia holy cow this has been <laughs> such a pleasure i feel so so grateful that you joined us on the show oh thank you thank you <laughs> thank you Thank yeah. you for uh, uplifting the powerful women in your world. I love the powerful women <laughs> in my world so, so much. And there is, we're going to build together. We're going to co-create. It's going to be beautiful. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Force Bathing is super exciting. Go check it out. Forcebathing.club. The link's in the bio, everyone. Check it out. Check it out. Uh, go and lead forest bathing and nature bathing yourself. Go and lead. Be a leader in your community and take people out of the cubicles and corporate offices and into nature and watch what happens as you go back. Go with your families. Go with your friends. Go and do that, everyone. Look out for Julia's book. When's it coming out? March 5th. March 5th, 2019. Look out, look out. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Leave us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this. Thank you, Ron, for producing and directing. Much love to you. And join us. Join us in the movement to rebirth the public intellectual. We have lots of interviews across the world that we're being invited to do with prominent figures and we need your help to get there. Join us on Patreon. Join us on Cryptocurrency. Links are below. Thank you very much for tuning in, everyone. Much love and we'll see you soon. Peace. <laughs>